A young man walks down by the banks of the black water under the full cold moon. He's been drinking the old year down to the dregs until his eyes grew sore and his stomach turned and he was tired of the bright lights and bustle. Now he looks east to the turning tide, out to the estuary slow and dark and the white gulls gleaming on the waves. I'll go for a dip, he thinks and coming down from the path, stands alone on the shore. The black water holds no fear. Give him a glass, and he'll drink it down, salt and seashell, oyster and all. But something alters in a turn of the tide or a change of the air. Nearer he goes, the gulls lift off one by one, and the last gives a scream of dismay. Clouds hide the moon, He thinks he sees, is certain he sees, the slow movement of something, vast, hunched, grimly covered over with rough and lapping scales. Then it is gone. In the darkness he grows afraid. There's something there. He feels it. But then the wind lifts and tugs the covering cloud, and the shy moon shows her face. (laughs) Nothing to fear in the black water. Only a moment of confusion in the darkness and far too much to drink. Just a quick dip, he thinks, for old Lang Syne. The pendulum swings from one year to the next, and there's darkness on the face of the deep. Dressed as the day demanded, Cora Seaborn sat before her mirror. Pearl drops on gold wires hung at each ear. So far as tears go, she said, these will have to do. The neckline of her dress was a little lower than she'd have liked, and showed on her collarbone an ornate scar as long as her thumb and about as wide. It was the perfect replica of the silver leaves on the silver candlesticks that flanked the silver mirror, and which her husband had pressed into her flesh as though he was sinking his signet ring into a pool of wax. She turned from the glass and surveyed the room. Any visitor would pause puzzled at the door, seeing on the one hand the high, soft bed and damask curtains of a wealthy woman, and on the other, the digs of a scholar. The furthest corner was papered with botanical prints and maps torn from atlases. On the mantelpiece, a dozen ammonites were ranked according to size. Above them, captured in a gilded frame, Mary Anning and her dog observed a fallen fragment of Lyme Regis rock. Was it all hers now? She supposed so, and at the thought a kind of lightness entered her limbs. There was grief, too, that was certain, and she was grateful for it, since however loathed he had been by the end, he deformed her, at least in part, and what good ever came of self-loathing? Memory unfurled like smoke from a blown candle. Seventeen and her father had presented her with pride. Cora, barefoot with Latin on her tongue, and Michael Seaborn had taken her hand and admired it and scolded her for a broken nail. On her nineteenth birthday, she exchanged birdsong for feathered fans, crickets in the long grass for a jacket dotted with beetles' wings. She was bound by whalebone, pierced with ivory, pinned by the hair with tortoiseshell. She walked nowhere. The widow was roused from her reverie by footsteps overhead, which were slow and measured out as precisely as the ticking of a clock. Francis, she said. She sat quietly, waiting. Frankie! How small he was, she thought. His face was impassive. He said, 
Where is he now? He will be waiting for us at the church. Ought she to take him into her arms? He did not look, it must be said, much in need of comfort. But there at last was Martha, brightening the room as she always did. She lightly touched Francis on the head, just as though he had been any other child. Her strong arm circled Cora's waist. She smelt of lemons. Come on then, she said. You never did like us to be late. The St. Martin's bells tolled for the dead, rolling out across Trafalgar Square. Cora watched the evening's performance with an interested detachment. Above her, on the high black balcony, was Luke Garrett. Imp, she thought, and her heart seemed almost to move towards her friend, pressing against the bars of her ribs. <laughs> his coat was no more fitting to the occasion than his surgeon's apron might have been. Afterwards, Cora stood on the steps and greeted the congregation, who were all kindness, all solicitude. Christ have mercy on us, said Dr. Garrett as the last of the mourners departed. He grasped Cora's gloved hand. Well done, Cora. You did well. Can I take you home, hmm? I'm hungry. Are you? I could eat a horse, and it's full. <laughs> you can't afford a horse. Martha only ever spoke to the doctor with a show of annoyance. His presence in the house at Foolish Street, first a matter of duty, then one of devotion, was an annoyance to Martha, who felt her own devotion to be more than adequate. I'd like, more than anything, to go for a long walk, said Cora. Garrett said, Cora, let me walk with you. You shouldn't do it, you can't go alone. <laughs> you shouldn't. Can't. I'm dressed for walking. See? She lifted her hem and displayed boots better suited to a schoolboy. Let me go alone. George Spencer was all that Garrett was not. Tall, wealthy, fair, shy, with feelings deeper than his thoughts were swift. Those who'd known both since their student days joked that Spencer was the imp's good conscience, severed from him somehow, always running to keep up. Garrett shoved himself deeper into his armchair. Spencer took out a cigarette and said, Has she gone? Cora? She went last week. The blinds are down at Foolish Street and the furniture's covered in dust sheets. I know because I looked. He scowled. She'd gone by the time I came by. That old witch, Martha, was there and wouldn't pass on the address. Said she needed rest and quiet and I'd hear from her in her own good time. Martha is one year older than you, said Spencer mildly, and admitted, Garrett, peace and quiet are two qualities which are not often linked with you. I'm her friend. Yes, but not a peaceful or a quiet one. Where has she gone? Colchester. Colchester? What is there at Colchester? A ruin and a river and web-footed peasants and mud. They're finding fossils on the coast. I read about it. Cora will be happy as a schoolboy there, up to her knees in mud. You'll see her soon. What good is soon? She should still be mourning. At this, neither met the other man's eye. She should be with people who love her. Cora Seaborn walked through Colchester with Martha on her arm, holding an umbrella above them both. Martha gestured towards a man whose legs ended above the knee and who had stationed himself opposite a cafe, the better to induce guilt in tourists with overfilled bellies. The crippled man was sitting on what Cora first took to be a stone bench, but which on looking closer she saw was a piece of fallen masonry. Good afternoon, she reached for her purse. The man cast his eyes up at the sky which at that moment split and displayed an astonishing blue interior. 
The brief brightness illuminated the building behind him, which Cora saw had been torn apart as though by an explosion. Thomas Taylor at your service. Not been here before, I take it. A few days. My friend and I... Cora gestured towards Martha, who stood a little distance away, stiff with disapproval. You've probably come about the earthquake, said Taylor, gesturing behind him to the ruins. Cora, always ready to be educated, indicated that she had. It had come, he said, eight years back by his reckoning. The Essex earth had bucked as if trying to shake off all its towns and villages. Out in the estuaries of the Cone and the Black Water, the sea had gathered into foaming waves which ransacked the shore and reduced every vessel on the water to splinters. Langano Church, known to be haunted, was shaken almost to bits, and the villages of Wivenhoe and Aberton were hardly more than rubble. Extraordinary, she said, delighted. It's all Paleozoic rock under our feet, this part of the world. To think of it, laid down five hundred million years before, shrugging its shoulders and bringing down the steeples on the churches. I don't know about that said Taylor. At any rate, Colchester did badly, as you see, though no lives lost. Cora reached for her purse. Well, now, said Taylor, taking a coin, there's more. I dare say you've heard tell of the Essex Serpent, which was once the terror of Henham and Wormingford, and has been seen again. Delighted, Cora said that she had not. So then, in 1669 it was, a man could scarcely walk a mile before coming up against a warning pinned to an oak or a gatepost. Strange news, they'd say, of a monstrous serpent with eyes like a sheep come out of the Essex waters and up to the birchwoods and commons. Those were the years of the Essex serpent, be it scale and sinew or wood and canvas or little but the ravings of madmen. Children were kept from the banks of the river, and fishermen wished for a better trade. And then it was gone, as soon as it came. For nigh on two hundred years we had neither hide nor hair of it, till the quake came, and something was shook loose down there under the water. Something was set free. Strange news, said Cora, and stranger things in heaven and earth. Tell me, was any picture ever taken of it? Did anyone think to make a report? None that I know of, he shrugged. Can't say as I put much store on it myself. Essex folk are over keen on this sort of thing. He surveyed them a while. I think you'd best be off wherever you're going, though mind the cracks in the pavements, since you never know what's between. Charles and Catherine Ambrose were an unlikely sight. She was diminutive, where he was large. The pair of them were generous, benevolent, and interested in the lives of others. When they'd insisted that no doctor but Garrett would do for the ailing Seaborn, it had seemed impossible to refuse. Well, what are you doing here? Visiting friends, said Catherine Ambrose. We're trying to persuade Colonel Howard to stand for Parliament next election. <laughs> but what are you doing in Colchester, Cora? Last month, two men were walking at the foot of the Mersey Cliffs and were almost knocked out by a landslip. They had the wit to take a look at the rubble and found fossil remains, but also a small mammal of some kind. It's been taken up to the British Museum for classification. Who knows what new species they might have discovered? Charles blamed himself for Cora's adoration for the geologist Mary Anning. She'd never shown the least interest in grubbing about among rocks and mud until finding herself at an Ambrose dinner party. 
seated beside an elderly man who'd spoken with Anning once and been in love with her memory ever since. He said, surely, <laughs> it's best left to the experts by now. You're not in the dark ages, reliant on crackpots in petticoats crawling about with a tack hammer and paintbrush. What do you expect me to do? Sit at home planning supper and waiting for a new pair of shoes to arrive? Cora's temper, which burned slow, made itself seen first in the hardening of her grey eyes to flint. Catherine placed a cool white hand on hers and said, And you intend to make your way there and find a beast of your own. I do, and I will, you'll see. Michael never... At the name she faltered and unconsciously touched the scar at her neck. He thought it a waste of time. She thrust her plate away in disgust. Well, I can do what I like now, can't I? Darling child, of course you can. And what's more, we can help. I know just the family for you. Do we? Charles looked dubious. Charles, the Ransoms, those gorgeous children in that awful house, and the good Reverend Ransom and little Stella, no bigger than a fairy and twice as pretty. They live down at Old Winter, which is almost as bad as it sounds. But if anyone could show you your way around the coast there, it's them. Go, don't look at me like that, dear. You know perfectly well you can't go trudging off with nothing but a map. Cora attempted to conquer her skull. Some bull-necked country curate, old Calvin and Correction, and his parsimonious wife. She could not, offhand, think of anything worse. But, still, it would be useful to have some local knowledge of Essex geography. I'll write to William, Charles said, and give him your address. You'll all make fast friends, I'm sure, and find piles of your wretched fossils. Old Winter had only one inn and two stores, and though its village green was occasionally considered the longest in Essex, there was very little to recommend it, even to its own inhabitants. Aside from the church's curiosities, the only item of interest within five miles was Leviathan, the blackened hull of a clipper, which could be seen when the Blackwater estuary lay at low tide. Since the discovery on New Year's morning of a drowned man down on the Blackwater marshes, the Essex serpent had ceased to be merely a device to keep children in check and had begun to stalk the streets. On Friday nights in the White Hare, drinkers claimed to have seen it. Children playing on the saltings needed no urging to come home before dark, and no amount of reasoning on Will's part could persuade them the drowned man was a victim of nothing more than drink and the tides. With the coming of the Essex Serpent, which he took to calling the Trouble reluctant to christen a rumour, claims on his time had grown steadily greater. He resolved to shake himself into a better frame of mind by walking a circuit of the parish. Henry Banks, who racketed up and down the estuary in his barge, sat cross-legged on the deck, mending his sails. Seeing Will, he beckoned him over, saying, Still no sign of a reverend. Still no sign, pulling dolefully at a hip flask. Some months had passed since Banks had lost a rowing boat and been refused his insurance on the grounds that he'd failed to make it fast to the quay, being probably drunk at the time. Banks told anyone who'd listened that it had been stolen and that he'd always been a truthful man, as Gracie would have witnessed had she still been living, God rest her. No? I'm sorry for it, Banks, said Will sincerely. He moved on, past the quay, where up ahead on a slight incline, a row of bare ash trees were like so many grey feathers stuck in the ground. Beyond the ashes was the last old winter house, which for as long as he could remember they'd called World's End. As Will approached World's End, its sole resident, Mr. Cracknell, held in his right hand the small grey body of a mole, and in his left, a folded knife. Stand back, little reverend, for the good of your coat, he said, and Will obeyed, seeing that strung all along the fence 
were a dozen moles or more, but these were skinned, and their hides hung from their hindquarters like a shadow. Twenty years an old winter man, and still your customs surprise me. Is there no better way of keeping moles from the crops than by scaring them off with their slaughtered brethren? Scaring them off, says he, though of what I might be scaring off there mightn't be knowing now nor later, I dare say. His hand on the wire trembled a little, and Will was appalled to see that so also did his lower lip. Mr. Cracknell, you don't mean to tell me you've strung up these poor beasts to fend off some rumoured sea serpent in the black water? I do say that caution is the side best heard on. And if man or creature were minded to make their approaches, my little scare beasts here would give them pause. He jerked his thumb towards the rear of his dwelling, where a pair of tethered goats industriously cropped a circle of grass. I've Gog and Magog here for companionship, you understand, and I'll not risk their loss, not I. I'll not be left alone. Will clasped the old man by the shoulder. Nor shall you. I have my flock, and you have yours, and the same shepherd has their care. Five miles east of Colchester, Cora walked in fine rain. She'd set out only wanting to get out of the cold room in the Red Lion, where Francis had cut his pillow to retrieve and count the feathers, rather than listen to her son's patient totting up. 173 as the door had closed. She belted up her coat and ran downstairs. On she walked. And though the cold rain and the black earth ought to have dispirited her, she could not summon up her widow's grief. Coming to her eighth mile, a curious sound reached her. It was a little like a child crying, but a child old enough to know better. Then another voice joined it and it was the voice of a man, crooning, patient, deep. She hitched up her coat and followed the sound. Overlooked by a bare oak, there was a shallow lake. On the nearer bank, a man stooped, struggling over something pale which made frantic movements and gave out another weak cry. The sound of it struck and sickened her, and there was something familiar in the wretched imploring movements it made, so that when she gathered pace and began to run, what she had hoped would be an imperious stop that stop came out as a shriek. The man may have heard her, or he may not. He neither lifted his head nor stopped whatever he was doing. As she drew nearer, she saw his feet planted firmly in muddy water and his back in a dark winter coat splashed with mud. What are you doing? Stop! At this he half turned, and she saw that he was not much above medium height and bulky. Smears of mud on his face gave the impression of a beard, and from the filth a pair of eyes blazed at her. He shrugged and turned back to his task. Reaching the water's rim, she saw that the pale thing struggling beneath the man was a sheep, dumbly struggling in the shallows. And she was rinsed with relief. Whatever horror she'd imagined, it was not this. The sheep rolled its stupid eyes at the newcomer and bleated. The man had his right arm hooked beneath its left foreleg and around its back, and with his left he was attempting to grasp its flank the better to haul it to safety, but his feet could not find a purchase on the slick earth. The movement frightened the animal, which with its left foreleg flailed out and struck the man across his cheek. He yelped, and Cora saw a wound open beneath the mask of mud. She said, let me help, and he gave a breathless grunt of assent. Man's a half-wit, she thought. Again the sheep went limp and allowed the man to clasp both arms behind its back. In their embrace, the two sank together into the mud, and looking furiously over his shoulder, the man said, Well, come on. Not quite a half-wit, then. Cora reached for her belt, and dashing forward, she looped it across the animal's back, where it would catch in the crook beneath its forelegs, forming a kind of bridle. The man released his grip and tugged the strap from her hand, and the animal gave a convulsive movement that threw Cora into the mud. The man showed her no concern, only grunted, Up! Get up! 
and gesturing that she should take the belt, again resumed his grip on the sheep's flank. There was a long moment in which their matched strength slowly worked against the sucking mud. Then all at once, the sheep's rear legs appeared above the water's surface, and it propelled itself forward onto the bank. Cora and the man fell back, and she turned away to conceal her breathlessness. She would not have minded the mud and the pain in her wrists had the man not been an oaf and the sheep not such a witless beast. When she turned back, the man was regarding her, above his sleeve which he had pressed to the cut on his cheek. He said, thanks, a little curtly. One of yours? Uh, no, not my flock. The idea evidently struck some chord of slow humour in him, and he began to chuckle. Well, I must be home. It was very nice to meet you. She gestured towards the dripping oaks and the pond where little eddies from their struggle still moved, and wishing to be generous, said, Essex, nice part of the world, is it? It occurred to her, as she saw the first thickening of the shadows at dusk, that she was miles from her bed, and with only a vague sense of where she stood. She said, Tell me, am I far from Colchester? Where can I fetch a cab home? The man nodded towards the further bank. Out onto the road, bare left, five hundred yards, there's a pub, they'll fetch it for you. Then he turned and trudged away through the mud. His shoulders were so stooped against the cold that the weight of his filthy coat made him seem very like a hunchback. Always more easily moved to mirth than rage, Cora could not prevent herself from laughing. Perhaps he heard, because he paused on the path, half turned towards her, then thought better of it, and went on his way. Dr. Luke Garrett, arriving late, having attempted to replicate a human vertebra in papier-mâché, found his friends seated on a thinning rug, their clothes studded all over with feathers. In a window seat, Martha turned the pages of a magazine and watched Francis silently threading feathers from gulls and crows through the weave of Spencer's coat, until he looked like an angel dismayed by its fall. Cora had come off relatively lightly, with a peacock plume sticking up from the back of her dress and the contents of a pillow dusting her shoulders. No one noticed the imp arrive, so that he turned and re-entered noisily. What is going on? <laughs> Have I come to the insane asylum? Where are my wings, then, or must I be earthbound? Cora? I have brought you books. Cora, Giving a little yell of delight, leapt up and kissed the newcomer on each cheek, holding him at arm's length. You've come! Have you grown? Half an inch at... No, that was cruel. I'm sorry. Only you're late, you know. Francis has a new hobby, as you see, and we're all being very patient about it. You look dreadful, said Luke. Who would have liked to touch one by one the freckles newly arrived on her forehead? Don't you brush your hair out in the sticks? Your hands are dirty, and what are you wearing? I've freed myself from the obligation to try and be beautiful, said Cora, and I was never more happy. I can't remember when I last looked in the mirror. Yesterday, said Martha, you were admiring your nose. Good evening, Dr. Garrett. This was said with so penetrating a chill. Luke shivered. Spencer, sitting beside Martha on the window seat, took up her magazine and said, May I see what you've been reading? He leafed through the booklet, which contained bewildering statistics on London's overpopulation and the catastrophic consequences of urban clearance. 
Martha's socialism was no less ingrained than any inherited faith still clung to, past childhood fervor. Taking her place in Cora's household had been an act of purest pragmatism. It permitted a degree of social acceptance and a reasonable wage. It placed her firmly outside the class she despised and equally firmly within it. But she had not bargained for Cora Seaborn. After all, who could? Spencer's long, melancholy face was flushed. She was conscious of his eagerness to please, and it roused her to mischief. All that is solid melts into air, she said, testing his courage. Shakespeare, he said, smiling, relenting. Martha said, Karl Marx, I'm afraid. Now, Cora, have you told the imp about your poor Essex parson and the serpent? Cora showed Luke photos of a plesiosaur uncovered at Lyme Regis and gestured to its long tail and its flippers rather like wings. Sea dragon, Mary Annan called it. You can see why, can't you? She snapped the book shut and told him how Charles Ambrose had foisted them on an unsuspecting rural priest and his family. Mirth doubled Luke at the waist, and he gestured to her man's boots and the earth beneath her fingernails. I hope the good reverend's faith is sincere, he said. He'll be needing it. Only Spencer, silently watching from his window seat, saw in Luke's hilarity the unease of a man who would have liked to keep Cora only for himself, with no other friend or confidant, even one choked with a dog collar and slow-witted to boot. Stella Ransom stood at the window, buttoning her blue dress. It was the view she liked best, taking in the chequered path with its bluebell border, and beyond that the high road with its cluster of cottages and shops, the sturdy All Saints Tower and the fresh red brick walls of the school. Nothing pleased her more than feeling that all around her was the bustle of life. She heard the children downstairs, ending their early supper and closing her eyes, saw each as plainly as if she'd gone to the kitchen. James bent over as he drew his fantastic machines, and Joanna, the eldest, tending sternly to John, the youngest, delighted at the prospect of the night's visitors they'd helped set the dining table with every piece of silver and glass in the house. At ten past eight, Stella Ransom and Cora Seaborn were seated side by side on the couch nearest the fire. Within moments, each had taken such a liking to the other, it was agreed it had been a great shame they had not met during childhood. Well, it's so pleased you've come, and we'll be so sorry to be late. I am so looking forward to meeting him. This was true. Cora decided that this delightful woman would not be so happy if she shared her life with an oaf of a parson, a bustle on the doorstep, and the sound of boots on the scraper. A large and heavy bunch of keys was fitted to the lock, and Stella Ransom leapt to her feet. Cora looked up and saw in the doorway a man stooping to kiss the woman where her fair hair parted. Stella was so little that he seemed to loom above her, though he was not especially tall. He was dressed smartly, in a black coat cut well across his shoulders and showing a breadth and strength that made a curious contrast with the little white collar of his office. Having embraced his wife, his hands resting lightly at her waist, he turned back to the door and said, See who I found on the path. He stood aside, plucking the white collar from his throat and tossing it onto a table. Then in came Charles Ambrose, in a scarlet frock coat, and behind him, Catherine, concealed by a bouquet of hothouse flowers. There was a flurry of greeting, then the little crowd came in. Charles and Catherine embraced Cora. Was she well? What of the sea dragon? And did they not love Stella already? And what did she make of the good Reverend Will? At this, a deep, quiet voice said, I've yet to meet our guests. Charles Ambrose conducted their host to the couch where Cora sat. She saw, above the open neck of a black shirt, a mouth pressed into a smile, 
eyes with the grain of polished oak, and a cheek which seemed to have been badly nicked while shaving. His smile was too polite for sincerity, but his eyes glittered with good humour. His voice, had she heard it before, had in it an echo of Essex, but he spoke like a scholar. She stood and held out her hand. Will, for his part, saw a tall, handsome woman, whose fine nose was specked with freckles, and whose mossy dress drew out a greenish cast in eyes which were largely grey. Despite the grandeur of her clothes, there was something boyish about her. Her face had not been powdered pale, but glowed where the briny Essex air had struck it. When she stood, he saw that her presence would be impossible to ignore, however hard one tried. At that moment he knew her at once. She was the roaring harridan who plunged out of the mist that day on the Colchester Road, when together they'd tugged the sheep from its muddy trap and he'd received the cut on his cheek. Will began to laugh, touching lightly the reddish mark the animal had made. Cora was briefly thrown. He put his hand in hers, and it was perhaps something in the pressure of his grasp that caused her to look again at the position of the cut on his cheek. And with a gasp, <gasps> you begin laughing too. Martha, watching the exchange with a sensation very like fear, saw her friend and their host each cling to the hand of the other, helpless with inexplicable merriment. It was Will, at last, who released her hand, and giving an ironic bow, said, I'm so pleased to meet you, Mrs. Seaborn. Might I offer you a drink? Stella, amused, but never keen to feel outside events, said, I take it you've met? Stella, more intrigued than ever by her guest, watched Cora from beneath her long, fair lashes. In her presence, the conversation veered dizzyingly from the content of Will's sermon to Charles Ambrose and his political scheming, pausing to briefly take in her scouring of the coast for fossils. We told Cora all about your Essex serpent, said Charles, peeling the wrapper from a chocolate. Both of them, indeed. There is only one that I know of, said William with perfect calm, and if our guests are interested, they can of course come and see it with me in the morning. It is beautiful, said Stella, leaning towards Cora. A serpent coiled all round the arm of a pew in the church, with wings folded on its back. Will thinks it a blasphemy, and threatens every week to take a chisel to it, but he wouldn't dare. I would like to see it very much, thank you. And tell me, has there been more news of the creature they say is in the river? No news, since there's no creature, though I'm afraid one of my parishioners might disagree. I've been to see Cracknell, said Will, turning to Stella. And either Gog or Magog has given up the ghost. Oh, said Stella, pouting, resolving to go out the following morning and take the old man a meal. What happened, Will? To hear him tell it, he thinks some monster appeared on the doorstep and snatched one of them out of his arms. No one believes in the serpent more than Cracknell. But a goat, frightened to death. Absurd. No, it was on its last legs and got out of its pen and into the cold. There's no monstrous serpent here, aside from the one carved in the church. Cora, ever the devil's advocate, said, But you are a man of God, who surely sent signs and wonders to his people. Is it so strange, after all, to think he's choosing to do so again, to call us to repentance? Now, <laughs> you do not believe that any more than I do. Our God is a God of reason and order, not of visitations in the night. And what if it is neither rumour nor a call to repentance, but merely a living thing, to be examined and catalogued and explained? Is your faith not all strangeness and mystery? all blood and brimstone, all seeing nothing in the dark, stumbling, making out dim shapes with your hands. You speak as if we were in the dark ages still, as if Essex still burned its witches. No, ours is a faith of enlightenment and clarity. I am not stumbling. I am running with patience the race that is set before me. There is a lamp on my path. Cora smiled. We both speak of illuminating the world, but we have different sources of light, you and I.
Will smiled and said, then we shall see who first blows out the other's candle, and raised his cup in a toast. Stella put her palms together as if she were in the midst of applause, but something caught at her throat and she began to cough. It shook her body and she clutched at the tablecloth and tipped over a glass of wine. Startled at once from his good humour, Will crouched at her side and with little practised taps on her narrow back murmured consolingly in her ear. The woman unfolded and looked out at them all from wet blue eyes. She said, I am sorry. What manners? Will you forgive me if I go up to bed? I've enjoyed myself so much. She reached across the table and clutched Cora's hand in both of hers. But you will be here in the morning, and I know we can show you one serpent at least. The All Saint Serpent was an innocent-seeming thing on the arm of the Restoration pew. Certainly the beast had held no fear for the mischievous craftsman, who'd coiled its tail three times around the spindle with sharp and lapping scales, but omitted either claws or teeth. The wings, Cora conceded, were a little sinister, but really it was hardly a signifier of the occult. It had endured two hundred years fondling from affectionate congregants, and its spine was worn smooth. Joanna ran her finger along a fresh groove in the wood. That's where he did it, she said. That's where he was going to cut it off with a chisel, but we wouldn't let him. The girl went out to greet the bell ringers on their morning duty. Frowning, Cora ran her thumb along the serpent's spine and said, I had faith, the sort I think you might be born with, but I've seen what it does, and I traded it in. It's a sort of blindness or a choice to be mad, to turn your back on everything new and wonderful, not to see that there's no fewer miracles in the microscope than in the Gospels. You think, you really think that it is one or the other, your faith or your reason, not only my reason. There's not enough of that to set against my soul, but my liberty. And sometimes I'm afraid I'll be punished for it, but I know punishment. I've learned how to stand it. He didn't understand, and was afraid to ask. But then Joanna came in and stood in the nave, while behind her, her bell ringers tugged at their ropes, and the bells sounded faintly indoors. The small village summoned up a hearty congregation. From a dim corner, Cora watched them bow for prayer and stand for song. Something in the second of the hymns, the melody perhaps, or a line or two half remembered from childhood, touched a place she thought had scarred over, and she began to cry. The tears would not stop, and Cora had nothing but her hair to wipe her eyes, only the preacher from his white stone vantage point saw her. He caught her eye and held it, and his look was one she could not remember having ever received from a man. It was not amused or acquisitive or appalled, had in it no hauteur or cruelty. It was brief, and his gaze moved on, out of decency and because the music had ended and since it was too late to conceal her disgrace, Cora let the tears fall. At the end of the service, Cora slipped out of the pew at its darkest side and encountered plainly awaiting her, Cracknell, and his fur-collared coat. How do, he said, 
delighted at having startled her. A stranger in our midst, I see. He flicked an earwig from his sleeve. You've heard tell of me, I expect, since the parson over there's an especial friend of mine. He gave her his hand and his name. <gasps> Mr. Cracknell, she said. Certainly I've heard of you and of your loss last night. I am sorry. A sheep, was it? Sheep, she says. Sheep, he chuckled, and then leaned forward to grasp her by the elbows. His voice dropped so that quite unconsciously she leaned in to hear him better. They've told you, then, about what's out there in the black water by moonlight. They've told you, and you've seen it yourself, perhaps. Heard it, perhaps. Smelt it, perhaps. He drew nearer. His breath had on it both fish and decay. He pressed her deeper back into the shadows. Let me go, she said, and put her hand on the pew to steady herself, and found it wet. Her hand slipped. She stumbled against Cracknell. He stumbled also, and in steadying himself, raised up his arms. His long coat opened and spread and showed its leather lining, black, greasy, with a flap of wings. Let me go, she said. And the door opened, and there stood Joanna at the threshold, letting in the light, and Martha with her. And Cracknell fell into the pew, saying that really he was ever so sorry, only it had been a troublesome few months, what with one thing and the other. I'm coming, called Cora, and we'd better rush if we're going to catch our train. In the last week of April, Cora moved with Martha and Francis into a grey house beside Old Winter Common. They'd grown tired of Colchester and the Red Lion. Cora felt something awaited her over in Old Winter, though whether she sought the living or the dead she couldn't quite say. Often she thought herself childish and credulous to be in pursuit of a living fossil in an Essex estuary, but if Charles Lyle countenanced the idea of a species outwitting extinction, so could she. Dr. Luke Garrett ran to the hospital gate, and on arrival found his entrance to the ward was blocked by a senior surgeon. Beside him, Spencer stood with his hands raised in a placating gesture. Dr. Garrett, said the older surgeon, I know what you're thinking, and you cannot do this. You cannot, can't I? I mean that you both cannot, and you must not. He wrung his hands. No one ever treated a wound of the heart and had the patient live. You could not stop me if you tried. I will waive my fee if they give me permission, and they will, because they will be desperate. Sister Fry stood at the window, adjusting a cotton blind to let the late sun in. Dr. Garrett, she said, Dr. Spencer, good afternoon. You, of course, will prepare before examining the patient. His name is Edward Burton, she said, 29 and in good health, a clerk in the Prudential Insurance Company. He was attacked by a stranger as he walked home to Bethnal Green. They found him on the steps of St. Paul's. Edward Burton, said Luke, and turned to the man beneath the sheet. At the rectory gate, Cora saw how Will stooped to kiss his wife. How lightly his fingers slipped through the fine, fair curls above her ear, and marvelled at their tenderness. In a sunny room, they dawdled over plates of cake, and admired the daffodils blooming on the table. And tell me, how is Catherine? How is Charles? Stella's appetite for the lies of others made her an easy companion. Charles has turned philanthropist, Cora said. Will raised an eyebrow and drained his tea. Charles Ambrose, he said. It's true, said Cora, laughing. It's Martha's doing, she turned to Stella. Martha is a socialist. London housing is the loudest bee in her bonnet. She's enlisted the help of our friend Spencer, who is embarrassingly rich, and who in turn is calling on Charles. I hear there's even a committee. Well, much good may it do them. I hope it will said Stella. 
To Cora's dismay, she dabbed at her eyes and said, All of a sudden, I'm tired. Cora, would you forgive me if I went up to bed? I can't shake the flu. She rose, and so did her guest. Cora kissed her and felt how hot her wet cheek was. The door closed behind Stella. Cora said, I should go. <sighs> Francis doesn't exactly need me, but he does like to know that come six o'clock there will be dinner on the table and that I will be eating it. She stood. He opened the door. I'll walk with you. I should do my rounds like a surgeon in a hospital. I must pay a call to Cracknell. I've ten minutes of liberty left. Let me walk with you to World's End and the water. I'm sure we'll be safe. April's too gentle a month for sea dragons. The tide was out. Mud and shingle gleamed in the westering light. And someone had wreathed the bones of Leviathan in yellow branches of broom. The air was sweet and clear. It went in like good wine. Neither was ever certain who first shielded their eyes against the dazzle on the water and saw what lay beyond. Only that all at once, both stood transfixed on the path above the saltings, gazing east. There, on the horizon, between the silver line of water and the sky, there lay a strip of pale and gauzy air. Within the strip, sailing far above the water, a barge moved slowly through the lower sky. It was possible to make out the separate pieces of its oxblood sail. On it went, flying in full sail, high above the estuary. For a moment it was possible to see the image of it inverted just beneath, as if a great mirror had been laid out. Then the mirror vanished, and the boat sailed on, alone. Then some member of the ghostly crew tugged a rope or dropped an anchor. The vessel ceased to move, only hung on, silent, wonderful, becalmed against the sky. William Ransom and Cora Seaborn, stripped of code and convention, even of speech, stood with her strong hand in his, children of the earth and lost in wonder. The British Museum, 29th of April. Dear Mrs. Seaborn, I've come to cram for something I must write, but instead find myself determined to get to the bottom of what we saw last night. I believe we witnessed a Fata Morgana illusion, named for the fairy Morgan Le Fay, who set about bewitching sailors to their death by building icy castles in the air above the sea. Cora, <laughs> you'd be amazed how much of it there is about. Naturally enough, there's a prosaic explanation. As I understand it, the illusion is created when a particular arrangement of cold and warm air creates a refracting lens. So while we stood there, baffled and bemused, I suppose that all along, somewhere out of sight, Banks was taking a shipment of wheat up to Clacton Quay. Round and round my thoughts have gone, turning, as they often do, to the Essex Serpent, until I begin to see how it might have appeared to us all in its various guises, and that far from there being one truth alone, there may be several truths, none of which it would be possible to prove or disprove. But it pleases me to think of you and me standing there together. Ungodly of me, I'm sure. But I would rather we were both deceived than me alone. With regards, William Ransom. By hand, I was there. I saw what you saw. I felt what you felt. As ever, Cora.
May, and the tender weather coaxes roses early from their beds. Naomi Banks is her father's daughter and knows the vagaries of the tides and how the water might buck above a sandbank or carry in its current the severed limbs of oaks. All the same, she's grown wary of the black water, or not set foot on the deck of the barge, skirts the quay as if convinced something down there will grasp her ankle as she passes. Her teacher chides her for a lazy, feckless thing, and sets her lines of punishment. But the words on the paper settle and shift like flies. Instead, she takes to making charcoal sketches in which a sea serpent, black-winged, blunt-beaked, snaps at her from the page. One night in her sleep, the Essex serpent lets just the wet tip of its tail show under her pillow and breathes coldly on the closed lids of her eyes. She wakes, expecting the sheets beneath her to be briny and damp. The dream seems to have something to do with the loss of her mother years before and leaves her too anxious to eat. Luke Garrett is alarmed to discover that he has become a celebrity. Spencer commissions him a leather belt with a heavy silver buckle, and on the buckle he asks to be engraved the snake of Asclepius coiling round its staff by way of commemorating the medical triumph. Uncertain what he thought might change once he'd proved it possible to close a cardiac wound, Luke discovers things remain the same. He admits to Spencer that he thought it might at last elevate him in Cora's estimation, but he feels himself outranked. Her move to Old Winter astounds him. But when they meet in Colchester, she speaks of William Ransom and grows so animated, her grey eyes gleam blue. Since her friendship with Martha, Joanna Ransom had changed her school seat to one very nearly under Mr. Caffin's nose. It had never before occurred to her to be shamed by a friendship with an almost illiterate fisherman's daughter. Naomi Banks felt Joanna depart from her and mourned. Her friend had begun to look on her with pity, which was worse than dislike. On the first Friday in May, Naomi came early to school. They'd been promised a morning with Mrs. Cora Seaborn who'd lived in London and been very important and who collected fossils and, as Mr. Caffin had put it, other specimens of note. Good morning, Mrs. Seaborn, they said, eyeing her with slight mistrust, and Cora eyed them back, a little nervous. She said, how pleased I am to be here. I'm going to start by telling you a story because anything that was ever worth knowing began with Once Upon a Time. As if we're babies, muttered Naomi, receiving a sharp kick from Joanna. But found that after all, it was a better school day than most to listen to Mrs. Seaborn tell her tale of the woman who'd once found a sea dragon cased in mud, and how all the earth was a graveyard with gods and monsters under their feet, waiting for weather or a hammer and brush to bring them up to a new kind of life. She reached into her bag, and they passed ammonites and toadstones from hand to hand. Hundreds of thousands of years old, she told them, perhaps millions. And Mr. Caffin, whose first twenty years had been spent in a Welsh Methodist chapel, coughed and looked a little aggrieved. Any questions for Mrs. Seaborn? How did birds end up in the rock, they said, and where were their eggs? Did they ever find humans there among the lizards and fish? And then, voices lowered just a little. What about the black water? Had she heard? Was something there? And was it coming? There may still be animals alive today, just like those we find in the rock, she said, treading carefully. After all, there are places in the world no one's ever walked, and water so deep they've never found the bottom. Who knows what we might have missed? Mr. Caffin coughed 
and with a roll of his eyes towards the youngest members of the class, indicated that his guest might prefer to keep to the stones and bones she brought in her bag. There is nothing to be afraid of, said Cora, except ignorance. What seems frightening is just waiting for you to shine a light on it. I don't know if there's anything out in the black water, but I do know this. If it came up on the banks and let us see it, we wouldn't see a monster, just an animal, as solid and real as you and me. Cora looked at her watch. Well, I've talked too long, and I think what I'd like more than anything is to see how well you all draw and paint. Would you like to come and choose something to draw? And when you're done, I'll pick the one I think is best, and whoever drew it will have a prize. At the mention of a prize, the class clattered up. Joanna Ransom remained placidly seated. Why don't we go up, said Naomi, itching to get her hands on some particularly beautiful rock, and show Mrs. Seaborn that she, too, was worthy of her attention. Because she's my friend, and I can't talk to her with you children all around, said Joanna, not meaning it nastily. But in Cora's presence, her old friend had seemed to dwindle in the chair beside her and grow shabby and stupid, her clothes torn and smelling of rotten fish deep in the seams, her hair in ugly bunches because her father never could get the hang of plaits. Behind her freckles, Naomi turned pale. She felt slights keenly, and never more keenly than this. Before she had a chance to respond, Joanna was at the woman's side, and had kissed her cheek, and was saying, I thought you did very well. Naomi hadn't eaten that day, and hunger made the room begin to turn about her. She tried to stand, but Mr. Caffin appeared at her desk and set down a pot of black ink, a sheaf of paper, and something that looked like a garden snail made of grey stone. What will I do with it? thought Naomi, hefting it in her right hand, and then her left. She would have liked to toss it at Cora Seaborn and strike her square on the forehead. Who was she anyway? They'd all been all right before she came. Probably she was a witch, she thought. Wouldn't put it past her with a coat like that. Probably the Essex serpent was a familiar she brought with her. The wickedness of the idea cheered her, and when Joanna came back to her seat, Naomi was circling her paintbrush in the pot of ink, laughing. Probably sleeps with it tethered to the end of the bed, she thought. Probably rides it. She stirred and stirred the pot of ink, and blots appeared on the sheet of white paper in front of her. Probably gives it her breast at night, she thought, and laughed harder. And he wasn't sure whether the laughter really had anything to do with her own thoughts, because it was so loud and strange, and she couldn't stop it. Even though she saw Joanna look puzzled and a little cross. It's probably here, on the step, outside the door, she thought. I bet she whistled for it like the farmer does with his dogs. Her laughter shook her and grew a little high-pitched, and it was the unmistakable pitch of fear. She glanced over first her left shoulder and then her right, but the classroom door was closed. The paintbrush in the ink pot went frantically round as if someone else were guiding her hand, and the desk jolted, and a jar of water toppled and spread across the ink-stained page. Look at it! There it is, thought Naomi, still laughing. Look, she said, to Joanna, or to Mr. Caffin, who appeared again in front of her, wringing her hands, saying something she couldn't hear above her own high peals of laughter. Can't you see it? she said, watching the water make the ink bloom, making the coiled body of a serpent of some kind, heart pulsing through the thin skin of its belly and a pair of black wings opening. Not long now, she said. Over her shoulder she looked, again and again, absolutely certain the serpent was on the threshold. She could smell it, certainly she could. She'd know that scent anywhere, and besides, others could see it too. There was Harriet in her yellow dress, and she was laughing, and craning her head so far over her shoulder, you'd think her neck would break. 
And there were the twins from across the road, who now dashed their heads left and right and left and right, snapping them back and forth and laughing as they did it. Cora, appalled, watched as laughter spread outward from the red-haired girl's desk, missing Joanna, moving around her like a flow of water interrupted by a rock. Some girls laughed behind hands pressed to their mouths. Others threw back their heads and roared, thumping the desk in front of them. Naomi, who'd begun it all, had worn herself out and sat giggling quietly, putting her hands in the water and ink that spilled across the paper, now and then pausing to look over her shoulder and giggle a little more loudly. The girl in the yellow dress, who was nearest the door, had laughed herself into frantic tears and had turned her chair around and sat facing the door, her hands pressed to her cheeks, chanting, It's coming, ready or not, coming, ready or not, between open-mouthed gulps at the air. Mr. Caffin, both outraged and afraid, plucked at his tie and cried, Stop this! Stop this! Looking furiously at their troublesome visitor, who'd gone very white and stood, gripping Joanna's hand in hers. Then a girl doubled over, laughing so violently, her chair toppled, and she fell to the floor with a yell that pierced the muddle of foolish laughter, which immediately began to recede. Naomi put her hand to her neck. It hurts, she said. Why does it hurt? What have you done? And looked round at her classmates, blinking and shaking her head, bemused at their tear-streaked faces. Little Harriet twisted the yellow hem of her dress and had a fit of the hiccups. And one or two of the older girls had gone to comfort the weeping child who cradled a swelling wrist beside an upturned chair. Joanna, said Naomi, looking at her friend. What's wrong? Was it me? What have I done this time? Old Winter, 15th of May. Luke, you're basking in your celebrity, I know, and are probably up to your elbows in a chest cavity somewhere, but now we need you. Luke, something's going wrong. Today, something went through the children here as fast as fire. Not sickness in the way it's usually meant, something in the mind. Down they all went like dominoes. By evening, all was well again. But what could have done it? Was it my fault? You understand these things. You had me under hypnosis when I would not believe that you could. Won't you come down? Something's here. Something's going on. Something isn't right. Love, Cora. In her grey house on the common, Cora stood waiting at the door. Since the morning in Mr. Catherine's classroom, she'd slept uneasily, feeling it all to have been her fault. There's no imagination like a child's, and she'd fattened it up till the Essex serpent was solid as the cows grazing under Traitor's Oak. Those girls, laughing and the snapping back and forth of their necks, it had been horrible and she relied on Luke to find some consoling explanation. In the aftermath, Joanna had grown withdrawn, and though she still went early to school with her books under her arm, she'd have nothing to do with Naomi Banks, and at the end of each day sat studying in the kitchen, where there was no chance she'd find herself alone. Cora had been afraid her new friends would blame her for the incident and for Joanna's somber state. But neither Will nor Stella had seen it happen, and when it was explained to them, could only think that girls were ridiculous creatures and always getting the giggles over nothing at all. Worst of all, Cora's cheerful interest in the Blackwater was soured. She didn't think it a judgment from God, but perhaps 
There were soft, dark places in all of them that ought not to be probed. Then came Luke, striking out over the common, clutching a case to his chest, seeing her at the threshold and breaking out almost into a run. Later that same week, Joanna folded her hands in her lap and surveyed the black-haired doctor with mistrust. Don't worry, he said. His manner was brisk, but Joe was not entirely fooled. Just do as you're told and you'll be all right. Tell her, Cora. And Cora had said, it's all right. He did it to me once, and I slept better that night than in years. They sat in the largest room in Cora's grey house, with no lights lit. On a large sofa, beneath the window, Stella sat between Cora and Martha, and the women held hands. You'd have thought they were in for a seance, and not a process no more mysterious, Luke said, than the removal of a tooth. Only Martha had disapproved of the plan to put the girl under hypnosis to see what light might be shed on what she called the laughing incident. Hypnosis, <laughs> she said. He makes it up. It's not even a word. The question of hypnosis had not been raised until certain other matters had been settled. Mr. Caffin, fearing for his career, had produced a report made in the days following, listing the names of the girls involved. He deplored Cora's presence in the village, but didn't dream of saying so. Naomi Banks, who began it all, refused to say anything other than that she had no idea what she'd been thinking and could they leave her alone. Parents were delighted to have their daughters examined by a London physician and declared one after the other in perfect health, save for six instances of ringworm which were treated on the spot and could not account for their hysteria. Luke, who had been introduced to Stella Ransom over lunch and noted the rosy bloom on each cheek, had said, There'll be something at the heart of the matter, a shared memory or fear. The question is how to allay the fears when the girls cannot or will not share them. Stella had pulled at the blue beads looped around her wrist and taken a liking to the scowling London doctor. Cora tells me you practice hypnosis. Am I saying it right? And that somehow... It might help Joanna. It had been tempting for Luke to take Stella's small hand and say that, yes, certainly it would help. But his ambition faltered before the blue eyes turned on him in trust. And he said, it might, but it might not, though I don't suppose it would do any harm. I have never tried it on anyone so young. She might resist it and laugh at me. Laugh, said Stella. I wish she would. I'd like to see her happy again. Cora turned to Luke, who'd taken Stella's wrist in a chivalrous gesture, hoping she'd not notice he was taking her pulse. And yes, as he'd suspected, it was skittish below the skin. Well, why don't we call Joe and ask her and see if she is willing? And since she had been willing... She lay now on the most comfortable couch, gazing up at the ceiling where the plaster had begun to peel. Drawing up a chair beside her and leaning in, Dr. Garrett said, Do you see a mark on the wall? There, above the fire where the paint is chipped. I want you to keep looking at it. However heavy your eyelids, however sore your eyes, there were other instructions delivered murmuringly. It was impossible to keep her open eyes fixed on the mark, and when permission was given to close them, she did so with a sigh and almost fell in her relief from the couch. She never knew until later what it was she said as she hovered midway between waking and dreaming. What she remembered was a polite rap on the door, then the drag of it against the carpet, and then her father's voice raised in a rage she'd never heard before. Will saw his daughter prone on a black couch, with her arms hanging at her sides and her mouth half open, while a creature bent over her and whispered. He'd come home from making his round of the parish to find the house empty, and calling for Stella, found a note on his study directing him to Cora's, 
should he care to join them. Joanna lay quite still, as if stunned by a blow. Her head was tilted back, and her half-open eyes had a vacant gaze. He was for a moment rigid with shock and distress. When he saw Stella and Cora observing placidly from a nearby sofa, evidently complicit in the scene, he found himself tripped into a fury. He crossed the room, and fitting his fingers beneath the crouching man's collar, tried to tug him from his chair. But if the rector was strong, the surgeon was heavy. There was a tussle which Cora briefly found hilarious before growing afraid that Will, in his righteous temper, might actually do her friend harm. She stood up and said, Mr. Ransom, Will, it's only Dr. Garrett. He's only trying to help. Joanna, frightened and drowsy, rolled from couch to floor and struck her head on the hard seat of a chair. She stared up at the ceiling and said, It's coming then knuckled at her eyes and sat up. Stella, who'd been half dozing despite the chill coming in through the open window, looked at her husband in surprise and went over to her daughter. How do you feel? Are you sick? Have you hurt your head? It was just so easy, said Joanna, rubbing her forehead, on which a white lump had begun to appear. She looked from the doctor to her father, and seeing how the two men stood rigid as far from each other as the room would allow, said, What's wrong? Did I do something wrong? You didn't, said Will. And although he did not take his eyes from those of the other man, it was quite clear to Cora where his anger was directed, and she felt a kind of contraction in her throat. Falling back on fine manners, she stood between the two and said, Luke... This is William Ransom, my friend. My friend, thought Luke. I never heard her say my husband or my son with so much pride. Will, this is Dr. Luke Garrett. We thought we'd help Joanna. She's not been herself since what happened at the school. Help? How? What were you doing? She's hurt. Look. You're lucky she didn't knock herself out. Hypnosis, said Joanna proudly. We can tell him later, said Stella, patting about for her jacket. All these raised voices, her head hurt. Nice to meet you, Reverend, I'm sure, said Luke, putting his hands in his pockets. Will turned away from his friend. Put your coat on, Stella. You're shivering. Why have they let you get cold? Yes, Joe. You can tell me all about it later. Good afternoon, Dr. Garrett. Perhaps we'll meet again. As if born on a tide of politeness, Will left the room with wife and daughter in his wake, not sparing a glance at Cora, who at that moment would have been as grateful for a glare as for a smile. I was an experiment, they heard Joanna say at the door, and now I'm hungry. Absolutely charming man, said Luke. Old Winter, 29th of May. Dear Will, Charles tells me I must apologise. Well, I shan't. I cannot apologise when I don't concede I've done wrong. I have been studying the scriptures, as you once urged me to do, and observe that you must allow me a further 489 transgressions before you cast me out. And why should my mind cede to yours? Why should yours to mine? Yours, Cora. Old Winter, 31st of May. Dear Mrs. Seaborn, thank you for your letter. Naturally, you are forgiven. In fact, I'd forgotten the incident I suppose you allude to, and I'm surprised you mention it. I hope you are well. Kind regards, William Ransom. Midsummer on the black water, and there are herons on the marsh. Leviathan is decked with spikes of rose bay willow herb and a rosemary wreath, and a patch of samphire grows at the prow. At midday, Naomi lies alone by its black ribs with her skirt up by her hips, saying her solstice spells. Joanna has stayed late at her school desk and says she'll not move until she can recite all the bones in the human skull. The Essex serpent recedes for a time. 
since how could it thrive under so benevolent a sun? Cora has planned a midsummer party. Charles and Catherine Ambrose are coming. Luke is coming. There will be William Ransom, stern as he is these days, and Stella in blue silk. At three in the afternoon, we'll pay Cracknell a visit. The old man's not well. And lies on a couch with his boots on. He knows the flutter in his chest will be a rattle come Christmas. Cora has walked four miles and comes to a place where roses are grown for bowls and vases in dining rooms elsewhere. As so often these days, she's thinking of Will. She cannot concede that she's done wrong or that she deserves to be in disgrace. But all the same, her conscience is pricked. Has she really ridden roughshod over him? What's more, she misses the whole Ransom household. The thought of Stella casts a shadow on the path. Has Will failed to see his wife's new strangeness? How she wears only blue and puts blue flowers in her hair? How she roots around the marshes for blue sea glass and bluish stones? How she's grown thinner but more vital-seeming? Her cheeks flushed, her motions hectic, her pansy eyes brighter than ever. I'll speak to Luke, thinks Cora. Luke will know. She arrives home with her arms full of dog roses in creamy bloom and three new freckles on her cheek. She puts her arms round Martha's waist, thinking how well they fit there in the groove above her broad hips and says, they're on their way. Everyone who's ever loved me and everyone I've ever loved. Late in the gentle evening, Stella Ransom walked over Old Winter Common with her husband on her right hand and her daughter on her left. She saw the grey house with all its bright lamps lit and in each window a jug of dog roses. Then they were on the doorstep and there was Cora in black silk, looking so stern and so serene that for a moment Will forgot his righteous indignation. Cora conveyed Stella at once to a broad, low seat on which a blue silk cushion was placed. Will went over to Dr. Garrett and heard himself say, I was rude. That day when we met, I shouldn't have flown off the handle like that. Will you forgive me? The doctor flushed and stammered and said, Don't mention it. It was just something I like to try out sometimes. We did it to Cora once. We didn't see any harm. I can't imagine anyone making Cora say anything she didn't want to say, said Will. And for a moment the air chilled, with each thinking the other had no right at all to an opinion on what Cora was likely to do. Under the table Francis peeled an orange brought down from Harrods in a paper bag. He saw Charles Ambrose sit beside Stella and give her a glass of cold water. Then Stella wiped her forehead with the back of her hand and said, We should dance the summer in. Can't someone play? I can do a waltz, said Joanna. Nothing else. At the piano, Joanna, straight-backed, played a run that took in every key, wincing and saying, It'll sound horrible. It's been left to get old and damp. Then she played a melody that was too fast and then too slow. Every several notes rang so dull as to not be heard, but no one was troubled. Luke Garrett went to stand by Cora's chair. He bowed like a courtier and said, Come on, you are almost as bad as me. Fine pair we'd make. But Stella, by the open window, had other ideas. Since I'm too tired to dance with my husband, will my friend take my place? Will? Imperious, laughing, she summoned him. Show Cora you're no ordinary parson, only ever at home with his books. Reluctantly, Will came forward. 
and stood alone in the centre of the room and held out his hands a little shyly. Cora, he said, it's no use denying her. I've tried. The imp is right, said Cora, going to meet him. If I dance, it will be badly. I've got no music in me. But Stella stood and came forward. Like a dancing master, she placed Cora's hand upon her husband's shoulder. See how well matched you are? She surveyed them a while, then returned, satisfied, to sit below the open window. Then William Ransom put his hand on Cora's waist, where her blouse was tucked, and Francis heard his mother sigh. She looked up. They stood quite still together. There was a quiet moment, and no one spoke. Francis, watching, burst a piece of orange on his tongue. He saw how his mother smiled at Will, and how the smile was met with a steady, stern look. How then her head moved, as though drawn back by the weight of her hair, and how his hand flexed at her waist, tugging at the fabric of her skirt. I don't understand any of this, thought Francis, seeing Martha withdraw and stand beside Luke, and seeing how perfectly her face mirrored his. They looked almost a little afraid. I can't keep playing it over and over, said Joanna at the piano. Should I stop? She raised her hands from the keys, watching her father. How odd they looked, simply standing there. I stop playing, I think, said Will, turning to his daughter, giving her a look which was almost an apology. He made a deep bow before his dancing partner and said, You'd have been better with anyone but me. I was never trained for this. Oh, please, said Cora. The fault's all mine. I'm good for nothing but books and walking. But Stella, you're shivering. Are you cold? She turned away from Will and stooped to take Stella's small hands in hers. I don't feel it, said Stella, glittering. Oh, I suppose Joe ought not to stay so late. Yes, said Will rather swiftly, as if grateful. Cora, will you forgive us if we go? William Ransom left with his wife on one arm and his daughter on the other, almost as though he'd buckled on a coat of armour. Cora seemed somehow to sweep them out onto the common. She closed the door and clapped her hands together in satisfaction. But it seemed to her watchful son that a false note rang out, as clearly as if Joe still sat at the ill-tuned piano. Why had William Ransom said nothing as he went out? Why had his mother not offered him her hand? What caused Martha and the imp to survey her silently now, as if she disappointed them? After Francis had been put to bed, reciting the Fibonacci series as another child might a fairy tale, Martha and Luke set about clearing the tables. Cora had, briefly, been very animated, then said that she was tired and needed her bed. Her friends had watched her run barefoot upstairs and grown companionable in their fear. I don't even think she knows, said Luke. She's like a child. I don't think she can see it what they've done, and all the while Stella there, watching, what can he give her? A country vicar afraid the world's changing, and besides, he already has a silly wife. Isn't that enough? Must he have Cora too? She's collecting him. Martha plucked grapes from their stem and rolled them across the table. That's what it is. She'd put him in a glass jar if she could, and label his parts in Latin and keep him on a shelf. I'd kill him if I could, said Luke. She's going away from me. Some distance away, approaching the marsh, Will walked alone, raging. Desire had never troubled him. He'd married Stella young and happily, and their hunger was innocent and easily sated. Oh, he loved Cora. He knew that had known it at once, but that also did not trouble him. At 
something had shifted there in the warm room. He'd put his hand on her waist and seen how she'd looked at him with her level, long look. He thought she might have been a little afraid of him, but no, it wasn't fear that darkened her eyes, but a challenge or satisfaction. Had she smiled? Joanna went to All Saints in the morning and found her father stooped in the shadows with a chisel in his hand. With furious movements, he worked at the serpent coiled on the arm of its pew. Over the years, the Essex oak had ossified and blackened, and though the creature's folded wings had come away and lay on the stone floor, it still grinned at its adversary, baring its teeth. No, said Joanna, and ran to the pew, and pulling at his sleeve, said, You can't do that. It isn't even yours. I'm in charge. I'll do what I think's right, he said, sounding not at all like her father, but like a boy who couldn't get his own way. Joanna stood tall beside him and considered bringing her fist down on his bent head. Then behind them, the church doors opened and the light came in, and there, with her red hair burning, was Naomi Banks. She was breathless with running, and her hands were coated with mud to the elbow. It's happened again, she said, and her voice rang in the vault. It's come again. Didn't I say it would? Old Winter, 24th of June. Dear Cora, I hope you are well. I couldn't write sooner, though I wanted to. Something has happened. Cracknell has been taken. Why do I put it like that? I knew he was ill. I sat with him the day before he died. We found him on the marsh. He seemed to have been looking up at something over him, though the coroner says there's no foul play. He must have been there all night. Joanna has decided we have to keep Magog. She put a rope around its neck and walked it all the way home. Of course, the villagers are in uproar. They're keeping their children in. Your imp of a doctor wrote. We travel to London next week, though Stella looks better now than lately and sleeps the whole night through. Cora. How to account for the longing I have for you. I was content. I had come to the end of everything new. I had no more surprises in store, and I never sought any. Ought I to be ashamed or troubled? I am not. I refuse to be. How do you like that, you rank atheist, you apostate? You have driven me to God, with love and with prayer, whether you like it or not. Will. Stella flinched under the stethoscope and breathed under instruction. Dr. Butler withdrew it and with a gentle hand tugged his patient's blouse into place. No doubt in my mind of tuberculosis, he said, seeing the pretty flush on the woman's cheek. Consumption, said Stella, animated by the news. She shall be isolated as much as possible, and the children shall be sent away when her symptoms worsen, said Luke, dispensing with pity. What use was that to a deadly disease? Take your time, Reverend. It's a shock, I know, said Dr. Butler, but modern medicine can do so much. I personally would recommend injections of tuberculin. Will turned to Luke Garrett and said, And you? What do you say? Are you going to bring out your knives? Perhaps a therapeutic pneumothorax? Dr. Garrett, Dr. Butler was shocked. I wouldn't hear of it. Only two or three undertaken so far and none in this country. Now is not the time to test the waters. I don't want you touching her, said Will, recalling how the imp had crouched whispering over Joanna. What about me? Stella said, frowning. Aren't you going to ask me? Well, isn't this body mine? Isn't it my disease? Over in Old Winter, Naomi Banks is missing. She went the day Cracknell was found, and she left behind a note. 
coming, ready or not, it says. And there are three kisses over leaf. Banks sails the black water and won't be consoled. The village is wary. A rota of night watchmen is set up. They sit by small fires on the marsh and make marks in a logbook. Banks is not permitted to join the watch on account of how Naomi is missing and is likelier than ever to drink. Will hears nothing from Cora. Cora reads her letters and does not reply. She takes Martha and Francis to London and spends irresponsibly on a good hotel, on extravagant meals, on shoes she doesn't like and will never wear. She drinks with Luke Garrett and Gordon's by the embankment, where the walls drip into the candles, and when pressed on the subject of her good reverend, dismisses him with an imperious wave. Garrett is no fool and would prefer her old way of merrily mentioning Will each second sentence. London, 27th of July. It's late, and you'll think I'm drunk, but my hand's steady. I could sew up a man's slit from throat to navel and never drop a stitch. Cora, I love you. Oh, I know, I've said it often, and you smile and take it because it is only the imp, but I must make you understand. I have loved you from the moment you came into that bright room in your dirty clothes, and you took my hand and said no other doctor would do. I loved you when you asked if I could save him, and I knew then you hoped I would not, and I knew I would not try. And I love your morning dress, which is a lie, and I love you when I watch you try and love your son. And I love you when you put your arms round Martha. Do you think anyone else will ever know each Cora as I have known them and love each just as much? Don't write. Don't come. I don't need it. It's not why I've written. Do you think my love will starve without your crumbs? Do you think I am not capable of humility? This is humility. I will tell you that I love you and know that you cannot return it. I will debase myself. It's the most that I can give and cannot be enough. Luke Catherine Ambrose had visited Cora with Joanna by her side. Soon after Stella's diagnosis, Catherine and Charles Ambrose had taken charge of the ransomed children. I'm glad to see you, said Cora, truthfully. What are you doing here in London, Cora, said Catherine. What made you leave when you were so happy and saw so much? If ever anyone could unravel the mystery of the Blackwater Beast, it surely should be you. Oh, all that mud and muddle, said Cora brightly, not fooling her friend for an instant. I'm a city mouse and always was. Besides... I didn't really know what I was doing. But you're going back to Essex soon, though, aren't you? said Joanna. You shouldn't leave your friends when they're ill, because that's when they need you. Her tears came and could not be stopped. Oh, yes, said Cora, ashamed of herself. Jojo, of course I'm going back. London, 20th of August. Luke, your letter came. How could you? How could you? Do you think I should pity you? I don't. You pity yourself enough for the two of us. You say you love me. Well, I knew that. And I love you. How could I not? And you call it crumbs. Friendship is not crumbs. You're not grubbing around for scraps while someone else takes the whole loaf. It's all I've got to give. Well... 
Let's leave it there. Cora. London, 21st of August. Luke, my imp, my dear, what have I done? I wrote without knowing what had happened. Martha told me what you did, and I'm not surprised. You have always been the bravest man I know. Tell me when I can come. Tell me where you are. With my love, dear Luke, believe me, Cora. London, 29th of August. Dear Mrs. Seaborn, I hope you are well. I should tell you at once that Luke doesn't know I'm writing. He'd be angry if I told him. But I think you should know what he has suffered. I know how he wrote to you. I saw your reply. I would never have thought you capable of such cruelty. But I'm not writing to take you to task, only to tell you what has happened in the days since we went to Bethnal Green. You must know by now how we encountered there the man who stabbed Edward Burton, and how Luke intervened to protect me. The worst of it is that he grasped the knife by the blade and so wounded his right hand. He asked me to operate. He refused anaesthetic and spoke of the hypnosis techniques he'd been studying and extracted from me a promise that I would not put him under anaesthetic unless he begged. I recall his words precisely. He said, I trust my mind more than I trust your hands. He asked me to unbind the bandages so that he could examine the wound and issue instructions before entering hypnosis. I operated for more than two hours. I gave it my best, and it was not enough. Let me tell you, where the knife failed, you have succeeded. He is shattered. You have turned out all his lights. You have broken all his windows. Three weeks have passed, and there has been no good news. The tendons that give movement to his index and middle fingers have shortened significantly, and they are crooked towards the palm, giving the appearance of a hook. Perhaps he might regain greater scope of movement if he were prepared to do the exercises he ought, but he has lost hope. Your second letter was a kind one, certainly but don't you know him well enough to keep your pity to yourself? I won't write again unless he asks me. He can't write. He can't hold a pen. Yours sincerely, George Spencer. Coming from the black water on a warm west wind, a vile smell entered the window of the rectory. William Ransom, sleepless in his study, thought perhaps a mouse lay rotting beneath the boards. Pressing his shirt's cuff to his mouth, he went on his knees below the desk, beside the empty chair he kept beside his own, and found nothing. Stella appeared at the threshold. What on earth? she said, caught between laughing and choking. What on earth? She held a bunch of lavender to her nose. A dead thing somewhere, said Will. Something on the common, a sheep. Ought he to go out there? Perhaps he should. Certainly he must. Who else was there to seek out the cause of all that had lately befallen the village? Out on the high road, a crowd had gathered. It did not occur to Will until that moment, until he scented on the dim air not only rottenness but fear that perhaps there was another cause to the foul odour besides misfortune. But there was Harriet's mother crossing herself. There was Banks, not yet sober, saying he'd not go down to the water in case the beast had belched up coils of red hair. Good morning, and a fine one at that, Will said. And what's this that's brought us all out of our beds? No answer came. Now, as you all know, I'm no seafaring man, he said heartily, thumping Banks on the shoulder. Mr. Banks, you know the Blackwater better than us all. What's the cause of this dreadful business, do you think? 
Not anything I ever smelt before or heard tell of, said Banks, muffled behind the sleeve of his coat. It's not natural. I know that. The odour strengthened as they drew near the saltings. Will's stomach turned in revulsion and fear. He did not believe they were shortly to encounter the Essex serpent sunning its thin wings on the shingle, snapping its beak, regurgitating a fragment of bone, but, oh, he was uneasy. They were all down on the salt shingle, standing by the black bones of Leviathan, looking in terror and pity at what the sea had given up. In parallel to the lapping water's edge, the carcass of a creature lay in putrefaction. It measured perhaps twenty feet in length, so that its further end seemed to taper almost to a point. It was wingless, limbless, its body taut as a drum skin and gleaming silver. All along the spine, the remnants of a single fin remained. Eyes large in diameter as a clenched fist looked blindly out, and behind them, a pair of gills split away from the silvery flesh. Either it had suffered an attack or caught against the hull of a Thames barge making its way to the capital. Within its open mouth, very fine teeth could be seen. Look, said Banks. That's all it was. For all its look of having detached itself from the illuminated margins of a manuscript, not the most superstitious of men could have believed this decaying fish to be a monster of myth. It was simply an animal, as they all were, and was dead, as they all would be. It was impossible to imagine that this blind, decaying thing cast out of its element, where its silver flank must have been lithe, beautiful, could have caused their terror. Where, besides, were the promised wings, the muscular limbs from which claws protruded? Something is moving, said Harriet's mother, who stood at the place where the creature's belly bulged against the shingle. Something inside is moving. Will came near, and saw a kind of shiver and writhing beneath the skin. All at once, as if slipping free of many small buttons, the belly opened up along the seam and spilled out a pale and writhing mass. The stench was unbearable. Each staggered back as if struck by a blow, and Banks could not prevent himself from running to Leviathan's bones and vomiting. He could not look. He could not. He imagined that there, among the white fragments still moving, he might see a skein of red hair. But one of the women, indifferent to the sight, stirred at the glistening mess with her foot and said, Tightworm, look at it, yards long and still hungry. Probably did for the beast, starved it from the inside. Seen it happen before. You're not going to take a look, Reverend. Found you had something to fear after all. Inclining his head, Will did take a look, reeling a little, saw the worm's last movements and its peculiar look of a length of white ribbon into which threads had been irregularly woven. What was the creator thinking of to come up with so revolting a creature, which moreover lived off the life of others? He supposed it served some purpose. Banks, said Will, what ought we to do? Leave it said Banks, in whose wet eyes new veins had broken. High tide'll take it, due eleven, or just after. Nature has her ways. The lens of the creature's eye grew milky. Will imagined, knowing himself foolish, that from the open mouth a last breath came. Stella Ransom lay on a white couch between two open windows hung with blue curtains. 
She wore a dark blue dressing gown and blue slippers and was decked with turquoise beads. On every windowsill, blue glass bottles glinted, shards of glass gathered from gutters and opaque nuggets tossed up by the tide. Awestruck, Francis knelt a little distance away and said, I like all your special things. I have special things too. Stella said, Then we share a habit of finding beauty no one else sees. She lowered her voice and whispered confidingly, It is a habit also of the angels, who we sometimes entertain unawares, and lately there's been a lot of them about. It troubled Cora to see her put her finger to her mouth in a gesture of secrecy and to see Francis make the gesture in return. The woman had certainly grown stranger in her absence. Was it the disease? Why had Will not written to tell her? Cora waited on the common in her man's tweed coat, watching all the while for Will. When he came, it was silently, as if he'd stolen up like a grinning boy. A light hand touched her arm above the elbow. Come on, Mrs. Seaborn. Let's go, he said. I feel I've so much to tell you. And Cora felt all her recent heaviness of spirit lift. They walked swiftly, matching step for step, leaving behind the village and the briny estuary breeze. Both had saved such stores of anecdote and complaint, of tall tale and half-formed theory, that fully an hour passed without pause. And after all that, nothing but a dead fish, Cora said. So much for the Essex serpent, its wing and beak. Truly, I have never felt more foolish. When they spoke of Stella, Cora turned her face away. She'd shown Will her tears once before, and had resolved not to do so again. Something has changed, he said. And they told me it would, but I never expected this. I wake in the night and I hear her singing from along the hall. I think she has the Essex serpent muddled up with Bible stories and doesn't really believe it has gone. But she's still your Stella, your star of the sea. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. What will you do? What treatment can she have? He told her of that anxious afternoon in the hospital. Dr. Butler wants to give her tuberculin, which is the fashion these days. And Luke. Still, she could not quite say the name without a rise of shame that stained her cheek. Forgive me. But I'm glad he's prevented from operating. He wanted to collapse her lungs, one at a time, to let the other heal. Don't misunderstand me. I regret very deeply his injury. But, really... I cannot think past Stella and her well-being. It's all that matters now. Then he flushed, as if caught out in a lie. What does Stella say? She tells me Christ is coming to gather up his jewels and that she is ready. Evening had come quickly, and the rosy sun was caught below a black bank of cloud. They'd come to a slight rise, and the path was traversed at regular intervals by forest routes that formed a broad and shallow flight of stairs. Everywhere was thickly mossed, and it laid down a carpet of vivid green. I was glad when you wrote, he said, diffidently. I'd had a bad day of it, and then there you were on the doormat. I am glad I swallowed my pride. He laughed and said, I always did enjoy fighting with you, but not over anything that mattered. Only matters of good and evil. Exactly. Look, we are in a cathedral. High overhead, the trees stooped and made a chancel arch. A branch had sheared off a nearby oak and left behind a peaked cavity above a deep shelf. Will said, why was it, when I had everything a man asks, I saw you and ever since was glad of you? 
Did you really think because you loved here, you couldn't love there? Poor Will. Did you think you had so little of it? He stooped beside a chestnut tree, rooting among fallen leaves for conkers, handing them to her one by one. I wish we were children, said Cora. She came closer. She sat beside him on the moss. Why can we not be like children and play together? Because you're not innocent, said Will. And nor am I. He tugged at her sleeve, a little rough. Do you think because you wear a man's coat I might forget what you are? And do you think I do it for you? She said. I forget I'm a woman. I set it aside. Do you think I should torture myself with high heel shoes and paint out my freckles so you're kept on your guard against me? No. I think you're guarding against yourself. You told me once you'd like to be nothing but an intellect, disembodied, untroubled by your own flesh and blood. I would. I would. I live in my mind and words. Yes, he said. But here you are too. Here. And moving aside the folds of her coat, he tugged her shirt where it was tucked at the waist, in the place where once he'd touched her and been disgraced by it. But not to touch her now would be to breach a natural law. Back she lay against the soft green stare in the thickening dusk and fixed her eyes on his, unsurprised, daring him. He raised her shirt, and there in the split between the black cloth of her clothes, he found her soft belly, very white, marked with the silver lines her son had made. He kissed it once and could not stop, and she rolled against him in delight. Please, she said, pulling at her skirt. Please. And he heard it like a command. Later that same night, hardly five miles distant, Luke Garrett walked alone beside barley fields harvested white. He came in time to an incline where grass grew thick, and here he rested against an oak. Frantic misery had dogged him since his arrival from London with a good-for-nothing hand, and in his pocket Cora's letter. Own nothing which is not beautiful or useful, she'd once said, and he was neither. Under the oak in the coming dawn, he grew calm. If I am useless, he thought. Can I not discard myself? There was no reason to continue. He looked up at the branches of the oak, and they were sturdy enough for a gallows. He found a branch fit to bear a stocky man. He fumbled at the buckle of his belt, and as he looped the strap through the silver buckle to form a noose, his thumb moved across the ridges which formed the symbol there. There it was, the coiled snake the sign of his profession. It called to mind Spencer, his long, anxious face, his loyalty, his habit of seeming always to be dashing after him to prevent some disaster. How extraordinary it was that he'd never once thought of his friend. Luke pictured him, waking now in the George, perhaps, probably thinking of Martha first, then of his friend in the adjoining room, wondering when Luke might wake. How then he'd grow uneasy and come knocking on the door? Would he go to the police or come searching himself? Would he find his friend hanging there with the buckle of his belt shearing the flesh behind his ear? Might he scrabble at the branch to bring him down? No. It was impossible to think that he could do such harm. And it was also unfair. Must he really struggle numbly on for the sake of George Spencer? Stella sat on her couch wrapped in many blankets. She was pleased to see the boy. Sit there by the window where I can see you. I've got things for you, said Francis, and kneeling a discreet distance away, laid out the bus ticket, the blue-banded stone, and a foil sweet wrapper the colour of a robin's egg. 
Then he put his hand in the other pocket and took out a white envelope. And I've got to give you this, which is a letter for your husband from my mother. Is he here? Martha said. In the garden, feeding Magog, if he can find her in the mist. Go and find him, why don't you, and take him the note. I've got something to tell you, he said when Martha had gone. What is it? said Stella. I won't be here much longer, you see, so you'll have to tell me quick. I got up this morning at half past five and went down to the salt marsh and that man Banks was there and there was lots of fog. I wanted to see if I could see it, the serpent, the trouble. What they said is in the water. They told me they found it, but I wasn't sure because obviously I hadn't seen it. Aha, the Essex serpent, my old adversary, my foe. Stella's eyes glittered. Well, he said, pressing on, there was such a lot of fog I couldn't see very much, but then I heard a noise, and there it was, big and dark and moving. Well, I looked and looked, and I tried to tell Banks, but he wouldn't come, and then the fog was gone for a bit, and then the sun came out, and I saw what it was. He told her what he'd seen, and how he'd laughed, and how then the fog and the tide had swallowed it up. Oh, she said, disbelieving, as he'd feared she would be, a little let down. Then, oh, and she too fell to laughing. Clasping her hands in her lap, she said, Well then, well, Francis, what are we going to do about it? We should show them, he said. We should go down there and show them. Show them, she said. Give me my notebook. Hand me my pen. I'm a ready writer. Come. She patted the vacant seat beside her, and Francis knelt there, leaning on her arm. I will show you what we'll do, you and I. She began to sketch. Francis wondered if he ought to be troubled or should call for Martha. But she put out her arm and drew him to her, and Francis leaned against her. I can't do it on my own. And who else understands, Frankie? Who else can help me? She told him what she had in mind. And shall we do it? He said. She tore the pages from the notebook and put them in his pocket. Tomorrow, she said when I've seen my babies again. Will you help? Do you promise? I will, he said. I do. Bad morning for it, said Thomas Taylor, surveying the lamplit Colchester Street. The sea fog was in its second day. Taylor was joined these days by an apprentice who sat cross-legged on a slab of stone. He was an odd, copper-headed lad, slight and silent, who soberly took instruction and, what's more, on finer mornings turned out cheerful caricatures of passing tourists, who parted readily with their coins and often came back for more. Can't see a bloody thing, said the apprentice. Nobody knows we're here. We might as well go home. Out on the high street where the mist thinned under the low sun, Joanna Ransom looked across to the ruin and saw the cripple there and the ragged child cross-legged on a marble plinth, bending over sheets of paper. She gasped and shrugging out of her brother's grasp, dashed blindly across the road. Joanna, called Catherine, frantic on the curb, trying both to reach the girl and prevent the boys from tumbling into the road. Charles walked with measured calm to the ruin, 
and was astonished to find Joanna bellowing at the crippled man and raining down blows on his shoulder. What have you done to Naomi? she said. Look what you've done to her beautiful hair. Charles interposed himself between the two, receiving a light slap on his arm, and all the while the boy stood staring at the ground. Joanna said, gulping a little at a threatened sob, they all said that you'd been stealing from the shop, but I told them you'd never do that, and then when you didn't come, we thought the trouble had got you, and you were here all along. Naomi Banks, I shall give you a black eye. It was good to walk their old paths, matching step for step. Naomi and Joanna walked on past Leviathan, feeling the air damp against their cheeks. The fog on the banks of the Blackwater was thick, particulate, full of pearly grains. What if it's still here? said Naomi, only half teasing. What if it's still here after all and has come back for us? Stop! said Joanna, fighting unwomanly tears. Beside her, Naomi had gone very still and put out a restraining hand. She looked back towards the shore. What have you seen? What is it? Then the pale pall lifted, and there it was, fifty yards distant, no more, black, snub-nosed, bulkier than either had imagined, wingless or sleeping, blunt-tailed, with an ugly lumpish surface, not the sleek lapping scales of fish or serpent. Naomi half screamed, half laughed, turning to bury her face in Joanna's shoulder. I told you, she whispered, hissing. Didn't I tell everyone? Joanna took a step towards it, curiously unafraid. Then it shifted, and there was grinding, almost of great teeth moving against each other in hunger, and she shrieked and leapt back. The fog closed about it, and they saw nothing but a shadow biding its time. We have to go, said Joanna. Can you get us back? But the light faded, and for a while they stumbled, helpless and blind on the shingle, each keeping back tears only for the sake of pride. Ready or not, ready or not, muttered Naomi for consolation. Then the low sun pierced the fog bank, and they found they'd come hard up against it, had almost stumbled on its wet black flank. Joanna yelped and pressed her hand to her mouth. There it was, there, after all this time, only an arm's length away, blind, slumbering perhaps, impossibly ungainly on the bank. Was it sleek in water, in its native element? Beside her, Naomi stood bolt upright, hands flung up, on the verge of the laughter that drove the schoolgirls mad. She was pointing at the markings, mouthing at the air. There was that grinding again, and she flinched, but all the same drew closer. Mummy, she said, mummy, and for a moment Joanna thought she was calling for her mother, who lay in the churchyard under the cheapest headstone to be had. Look! said Naomi, whispering. Look there! I know those letters, even upside down. Gracie, it says. My mum's name. Forward she ran on the shingle, in the lifting mist, and Joanna tried to call her back. But all the fear had left her friend, and took with it her own terror, so that she too moved towards the dark shape shifting on the marsh. The strengthening sun cast a clear light on the shingle, so that each girl saw at the same bright moment what had been cast up. It was a black boat, small and clinker-built, long sunk in the black water and thick with barnacles which gave it the look of uneven flesh, coarse and battle-scarred. Its upturned hull had rotted and begun to sink, so that there was the impression of a blunt snout nosing at the shore. It moved in the last lap of the receding tide, causing its wood to grind against the shingle, and now and then its timbers groaned in distress. It was possible to make out, beneath the draping of bladderwreck and sugar kelp, the name Gracie, picked out in blue-white paint. 
Banks' boat, long since given up for lost, all the while casting up on the marsh on the whim of the tides, sending a village clean out of its wits. They clutched each other, not knowing whether to laugh or weep. It was here all along, said Naomi. We ought to tell my father, said Joanna. I'll stay, said Naomi. Go on, Jojo, fast as you can before it gets too dark to see. It's funny, said Joanna, turning away to the path above the shingle. There's something blue sticking out underneath. Can you see? Cora looked up from the book she'd not been reading. And there was Francis at the door. He'd been running. That much was evident. His thin chest fluttered beneath his jacket. Frankie, she said. Frankie, are you hurt? He stood neatly at the threshold, as if afraid he ought not to come in. He took a folded sheet of paper from his pocket, which he opened carefully and smoothed against his sleeve. Then, clutching the paper to his chest, he said, with eyes turned to hers in an appeal she'd never seen before, I'm afraid I've done something wrong. Will was walking on the high road with Joanna and Naomi by his side. How proud they are, he thought. Then, Cora, called out Joanna and waved. And there was his friend on the path, running, or almost. What's wrong, said Naomi. Cora's cheeks were wet, her mouth open in distress. She clutched a sheet of paper, which she waved at them as she came, like a signal none of them could decipher. She reached them and hardly paused, only tugged at Will's sleeve and said, I think Stella is down there by the water. I think something is wrong. But we have just come from there. It's nothing. It's, it's the boat Banks lost. But Cora by then had gone. The scrap of paper thrust at Will and dropped on the wet path, and for a moment he could neither move nor speak. He was the last to reach the wreck. There was Cora, kneeling in the mud, straining against the hull, and there were the girls at her side, kneeling also. He saw the blue-banded stones set around the ruined boat, the scrap of pale ribbon just visible, the blue glass bottle set upright in the shingle. Stella, Stella, they called over and over. Their hands slipped on the wet wood, and the three women lifted up the boat, which was not so heavy after all, and disintegrated as it moved. Lying there in the shadows, shrouded, silent, set about with all her blue tokens, lay Stella Ransom. Seeing her, Will cried out. And so also did Cora. She lost her hold in the boat which fell away, breaking apart on the marsh. Then Stella basked in the day's last light, her thin blue dress showing all the pretty bones of her hips and shoulders. She held a bunch of lavender that still gave off its scent, and nestled around were her blue glass bottles, her scraps of cambric and cotton, under her head a blue silk cushion, and at her feet her blue notebook curling in the damp. Her skin also was blue, her mouth dusted with it, her veins marbling close to the skin, the lids of her closed eyes were touched with purple. William Ransom, on his knees, drew his wife towards him. Stella, he said, kissing her forehead, I'm here. Stella, we've come to take you home. Will takes off his collar, throws down his parson's black coat. Stella's waiting, curled kittenish under a blanket, putting out her arms. Tell me who you saw and what they said, she says. They're children again, or nearly, laughing, dismissing all others, falling into half-remembered phrases that would be nonsensical if anyone overheard. But no one does. The house is empty, the children gone for a time. Daily, Will walks out between fields, 
By an effort he thinks might one day halt his heart, he sets Cora aside, so long as he's under any old winter roof, and takes her out again in the bare forest, by the Colchester Road, down on the Blackwater Marsh. What is she to him, after all? The truth is that casting about for how best to name her, he can land on nothing more exact, more honest, than to say, She is my friend. Dear Will, Here I am again in Foolish Street, and I am left alone. Martha's gone to Edward Burton now, half-wife and half-conspirator. Frankie's away at school, and he writes, which he never did before. Luke heals, though more for Spencer's sake than mine. I hope I'll see them all soon. Yesterday I walked to Clerkenwell in the morning, and stood by the iron grate where the fleet flows, and listened, and imagined I heard the waters of all the rivers I have known. Then it carried me in spate to the Essex shore, to all the marsh and shingle, and I tasted on my lips the salt air, which is also like the flesh of oysters, and I felt my heart cleaving, as I felt it there, in the dark wood, on the green stair, and as I feel it now, something severed, and something joined. The sun on my back through the window is warm, and I hear a chaffinch singing. I am torn, and I am mended. I want everything, and need nothing. I love you, and I am content without you. Even so, come quickly. <laughs>